Okay, so you know, as usual, I'm you're seeing where we left off last time. Last time I spoke about right thought or right intention, sama sankapa, which is the second you know factor on the noble eightfold path, and after it, the next three factors are right or wise speech, right or wise action, and right or wise livelihood. And those three factors, you know, they are about embodied life. You know, they can only arise as right or wise if they are based on wholesome thought processes or on wholesome intentions and not on unwholesome ones. And unwholesome ones are those thought processes and those intentions which are, you know, coming through greed, hatred, and delusion. And there's this a very well-known quote which I want to just reread today because it's so fundamental to the Buddhist teaching. Whatever one frequently thinks and ponders upon, that becomes the inclination of the mind. And then, you know, it comes out into the world through our, our speech, through our action, and through the way we um, make our livelihood. And, you know, if right view and right thought or right intention are really in accordance with the Dhamma, then the speech, action, and livelihood which arises from that is automatically wise and wholesome. And we automatically, you know, gonna go in the right direction of, you know, living a wholesome life, and at the same time also going towards full awakening through letting go and transformation of all ignorance. And you know, I think that's the sum and bonum of the path. But while we are walking in that direction, we can also really benefit others and ourselves. And in order you know, to be able to do that, we need to know what is the definition of wrong speech and of wrong action and wrong livelihood. That's how we can find it in the scriptures. And I just want to very shortly go over it. And, you know, right speech is, is defined as abandoning false speech. Abandoning malicious speech, which is dividing people. Abandoning harsh speech. And abandoning gossip or unnecessary speech. So those four are to be transformed. And then right action is not killing, not stealing, and not engaging in sexual misconduct. And right livelihood is not trading in weapons, not trading in living beings, not trading in meat, not trading in intoxicants, and not trading in poisons. So that's the five trades one should not engage in. And I think, you know, fossil fuel would come onto that list if the Buddha would live today, because it, you know, turns out to be a poison for us. So those are the very short definitions of this uh, embodied way of living the Noble Eightfold Path. And, you know, the, the five precepts are actually, you know, the container within which we are training ourselves to be increasingly able to really uh, live in that way. Because it's not something, you know, we can automatically immediately do, but we can have the precepts, either five or more, you know, in order to give us a container, to give us a, like a, you know, like a, a fence, you know, within which we try to live and then we bang against it here and there. And then it can help us, you know, to, to wake up to our own uh, patterns. The, which we have been cultivating for a long time and 
we can't so easily quickly change all of this. And that is the most important and most difficult part of the practice, you know, to hold steady when the habit energy is going crazy, you know, and it can feel very, very uncomfortable in the body, you know, quite painful sometimes. And, uh, you know, usually we are splitting off that energy into the head and then we sink, 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 and try to sink our way out of the intensity of the experience. And, you know, as I have been saying many times, what is really important is to learn to be with the intensity of the experience and through the being with, through being mindful of that intensity, to be really able to be with those sensations, then the transformation can begin. And the five precepts are our protection for that. You know, they are the minimum of ethical awareness we need to bring onto the path so that we can go in the right direction. And then there are other forms, you know, the eight precepts and then 10 precepts and then the bhikkhu and bhikkhuni precepts, which are even more. But it's all based on those five precepts. They are ethical. And the other precepts which are added to it, they are basically... Uh, renunciant precepts and they can help us you know to save our energy basically and uh, invest it into a real full uh, application of what's possible but five precepts are enough if we are living in the world and all of that you know is really there to help us to deal with the reluctance to sense and to feel the power of habit and that urge, you know, to act in the same way we have always been acting, to speak in the same way we have always been speaking. But then one day, you know, when we start to understand how the process works, we can develop the strength, you know, to hold steady with that. And through the intensity we go deeper and also wider and our kind of frame of reference starts to expand and through that expanded context insight occurs and when insight occurs you know then certain filters drop away and there is a clearer seeing and from that clearer seeing you know we can suddenly see solutions for ourselves and for our world we couldn't see before because they were hidden from our view because of the, you know, the contraction within which we were living. So this is a very, you know, very fundamental dynamic of the path, you know, to be able to hold steady with the pressure of the habit energy and then inside of that pressure, you know, freeing up the energy by sensing and feeling that which hasn't been sensed and felt felt before. And sometimes, you know, when we were in earlier times of our lives, that was the only response we could come up with because it was overwhelming for us when we were maybe little infants. Then, you know, the trauma response is a very skillful response in order to survive the situation but then if we are enacting that response endlessly you know even now when we are already adults that isn't really growthful for us because that keeps us stuck keeps us stuck you know in in a vortex and once we start to understand you know that the only thing we really need to do is to stop splitting off the energy into the sinking mind and just going into the body. Because it feels like counterintuitive, you know, because of the pain, because of the contraction, because of the intensity, and because we tell ourselves, you know, that we can't do this. Because that was the original response when we were infants. We really couldn't do it. But now we actually can, but in order to, you know, to really uh, step into that transformation process, 
we can really simply use the Noble Eightfold Path and look at this in a way, you know, which is going towards letting go and going towards transformation rather than repetition compulsion. And, you know, like a broken record, doing the same thing again and again, and then being surprised, you know, that we are attracting the same situations again and again until we can see those connections and then it starts to click, you know, and then through that, we suddenly have the inspiration to try something differently, to resource ourselves, you know, by being with people who are supportive, by listening to teachings which are supportive, by living in ways which are saving our energy for that which is going in the right direction and pulling it off those uh, occupations and things, you know, which are going not in the right direction. And, uh, you know, the reluctance to feel and sense is the greatest obstacle in that regard. But the first uh, step is, you know, to notice the reluctance, to notice the contraction, to notice, you know, how even the most, you know, a little thing like, you know, having a certain ritual in the morning when you eat your breakfast and if one element is missing, I think you know how that feels, you know. So this is just a very good example, you know, how vulnerable we are in that regard if we don't understand these processes. Because then we really believe, you know, that if we have an unpleasant feeling, that it is downright a wrong thing and we need to make sure it's not going to happen. So I think, you know, in a society like ours where, where so much is, is about comfort and about shopping and consuming in order to create more comfort, we really um, are very, very vulnerable in that regard because we haven't really understood the benefits of resilience, you know, of being more independent from those perks. Of course, you know, it's lovely to enjoy those things, in particular over the holidays and so on, but to become completely dependent on it isn't really enjoyable. And, you know, especially now at a time in history where we're standing on a threshold, an evolutionary threshold where it's becomes clear to more and more of us, you know, that the way how we live on the planet is not sustainable. We are too many people, we cannot continue with that story, you know, of um, we can all have, you know, what we want and even more than that. So it is a really, it's a, it's a matter of survival really to see the blindness you know in all of this to become aware how uh, disconnected we have become from the bigger context and to notice you know that this is actually like a paradigm which is already dying because it shows so many uh, holes and cracks already and, and we can really, instead of trying to pretend it's not happening or try to glue those cracks together, we can just take an interest in that which is becoming visible through the cracks. A different way of being in the world which has a lot to do with respect for more than human life and also which is seeing that it is really important to remove ourselves from the center of our worldview and see things in a yeah, much, much vaster context. This is the way in which can lead to a more sustainable way of living in the world. And at the same time, also, it is an expression of emptiness really that all phenomena including ourselves and our dogs and our cars and and our 
everything, you know, are not existing from their own side, but they are coming together of causes and conditions and they are impermanent. So this teaching can really help us to find some footing from which we can meet what is upon us, you know, at this time where things are starting to disintegrate more and more. And yesterday, you know, I was watching the Christmas sermon of a Palestinian priest in, in Bethlehem. And he has built a very beautiful um, nativity scene and he, in, the, in the church there in Bethlehem where there was, you know, the baby Jesus lying on a big heap of rubble. And instead of his nap, the nap, the nappy he had was, you know, made of a Palestinian scarf. And it was just a very powerful, you know, depiction of uh, how far we have come, you know, that in the in the church, you know, where there have been always these kind of glorious celebrations around Christmas, the priest, you know, installs like a heap of rubble with baby Jesus on it. So that means, you know, there's something seriously falling apart at our time. And we can't stop that falling apart. It needs to fall apart. But if we can focus on something which is coming out from underneath all of that, it can make sense again. And in order for it to make sense again, we have to be willing to sense into our own bodies. And, you know, notice the habitual reaction, you know, that whenever the feelings or the sensations in the body get intense, we tend to split off into the head and try to make a story out of it. Because we just haven't developed the power, you know, to be with the highs and lows as, as they express themselves in the body. And that's such a fundamental skill. We need to take an interest in learning. So feeling and sensing coming alive again, that's what the world needs now, you know. For example, in looking at the image of the nativity scene in that church in, in Bethlehem, with the heap of rubber, and then really not thinking about it, but just taking it in what that does in the body. That's how that works, you know. That's how transformation works. And this true willingness, you know, to stand on a threshold of a new way of being in the world, that is, you know, what we need to do together. And we can do it because we already have the teachings. But I think we haven't been aware of its implication, you know, for the bigger context. We have always known, you know, it is about liberation of the mind and the heart, which can, you know, take us all the way to complete end of suffering and uh, nirvana, nibbana, how it's called in the teaching. But also at the same time, it can also lead us to break through old patterns, how we organize our societies. So it has a, a mundane and a super mundane implication. And at this time, you know, we need to pay attention to both more than ever. And they both go into the same direction. You know, and it's it's understandable if there is reluctance and fear and doubt. But it is necessary to include it also into our awareness. Because this is normal to be afraid when everything is starting to move. Everything what we have known, you know, even the church in Bethlehem displaying something so 
utterly different. So even those very, very traditional situations, you know, starting to no longer hold. Because there's something falling apart. And, you know, that's crucial for the transformation is to allow the falling apart while at the same time taking care as a community. You know, really seeing how this inability to sense and feel has such horrible results as what we can see in the Middle East right now. But there's this repetition compulsion of the same thing happening over and over again. And there is no way that that will ever lead to the solution. The only way is to stop. is to stop to do things the same way it has always been done. And, you know, and I really see that What's happening in the Middle East is just really mirroring back to us how not, how it can't work this way. This cannot lead to anything other than more suffering. This way of doing things, of not wanting to be with not knowing what to do and just stopping and acknowledging that. And then from that acknowledgement, a new way will emerge. But first we need to stop. You know, being willing to come to the table and keep keep the five precepts and then speak from there. And what's going on there is just, just so much the opposite. And it's just such a, you know, such an un, how would I say that, you know, in the first, on the first look, it, it, it seems counterintuitive, you know, how can it be the way forward to stop and then go into the body? Because, you know, if we go straight to the mind, we just repeat and repeat and repeat the same thinking from the same level of consciousness, which created the problem in the first place. We need to go deeper. And that can only happen through the body.
and you know, but first acknowledging that this is not a personal body, but this is a human body, a mammalian body. And we can feel, you know, life pulsing through this body for thousands of generations. From conception to conception. You know, and we are basically landing that body from, from the planet for the amount of years we are here. But it's not really our body. So and life, you know, flows through this whole lineage. And we are part of it. We are part of the lineage of life, all of us. Wherever we live on this planet, we're all part of that same lineage. And life, you know, it's like a river flowing through all of these generations. And also through the modern human world. It flows through us and we inside of it. And we can, you know, really connect with that vibrancy. by sensing into the body and also, you know, sensing the gravity which pulls us towards the earth, which is also a living process. So really, you know, sensing into that vibrancy, <clears throat> you know, which can manifest in so many different ways as joy, as fear, as confusion, as aggression. You know, depending on the capacity of the body which is resonating and you know through these meditations we can see it's the uh, perception you know from which we are participating in a process which influences, you know, the energetic experience of the body. Then, you know, we know intensity is negative. Intensity is just intensity. But then if we are thinking there's something wrong with intensity, it we can call it fear, we can call it aggression. We can call it anxiety or desire. But it depends, you know, on the uh, expansiveness of the holding. And that 
is dependent on the perception of how we experience ourselves in what context. As we are seeing you know, an old way of doing things starting to show more and more cracks, Can is that a bad thing or is it maybe a good thing? Is that showing you know, expansion? Or if we are just desperately trying to get back to how it was before, then Just gonna stay stuck. So by connecting you know, with that vibrancy in our bodies, but also The spaciousness which we are sitting in, which doesn't end at the walls of the room, just connecting with that vibrancy around us. And inviting, you know, uh, insights and innovation to become available as we are opening to a bigger context. And as we are, you know, noticing that life is pulsing through us and that these bodies are not personal bodies, they are biocomputers which have been developed over millions, billions of years on this planet. And we can tune into that self-regulating intelligence But you know, listening into the, the silence and tuning into that uh, vibrations through resonating, just resonating with the body as if the body would be an organ of listening. Listening to something which is not coming to us through words. It's a wordless transmission, as a wordless listening. But the body is resonating with the vibrancy of the emptiness we are. listening to. Or sensing into. And you know that intelligence resonates differently with the intelligence which is mind we are listening from. Different gifts and 
Helen sent. skills you know we are born in we have come you know to the to this incarnation this lifetime but we can all you know open and be with the not knowing and allowing that unmanifest wisdom and compassion to resonate with us. Just making oneself available. But just inviting that unmanifest wisdom and compassion to speak to us without words. So listening into the silence, the vibrancy of the unmanifest. You know, and through that expansion of consciousness, being able to see solutions for our world which are leading onwards not keeping us stuck in repetition of trauma again and again the same thing happening polarization projection and the atrocities you know which we can see which are going on the Middle East. You know, inviting uh, the blessings of the future generations to, to help us to find a way forward. It is, and the blessings of all of the ancestors. You know, for us to manifest a higher potential. for our collective future on this planet. And really asking, you know, for guidance. You 
as we are witnessing such a terrible explosion of ignorance. Where people are completely reacting out of their trauma and they don't even know it. They can be our presidents of countries who don't have a clue about trauma. This is so sad. So, you know, asking for the blessings from the past and future generations to that we have the capacity to make wiser decisions so that life on this planet can continue to thrive. As we are now going into the next year, when we meet next time, it's already going to be 24. So living on this planet in a way so that future generations can also find what they need here. Not what they want, but what they need. And for us, in order to resonate with that vibrancy of uh, unmanifest wisdom and compassion, we need to be fully in the present moment in our bodies, which are you know, our instrument for cultivating consciousness, expanding consciousness. And just letting go ever more of this uh, self-serving, fearful, contracted patterns. And you know, we have a path for that, the Noble Eightfold Path, starting with right view and right thought. And then starting you know, to really become embodied through right speech, right action, right livelihood. So inviting the blessings you know, of the ancestors and future generations to support us in this time of great darkness. And seeing how that informs our own uh, work, our ethics, what we can con contribute to our com communities and our life as a global citizen, what we can do.
and how we can live, you know, our calling, our spiritual calling, how we can live that in the world. For our own healing and, and for the healing of the planet. Our small inner contribution. You know, starting just with, you know, the five precepts, with the first of the five precepts of not harming. I mean, that, just taking that in, you know, and really taking that to heart, man opens up the whole path. Such a conundrum, you know, in a world like riddled with so many intense dynamics as what's happening right now. And being willing to not turn away from that. And by sensing into that body, that earth body of ours, which has, you know, arisen from the planet and we'll go back into it when we die. And with the help of that body and our sensing that which calls us, where we can contribute. And that's also our own resource. The resource for our own healing work. And how the way we can express this in the world, our, our purpose, our calling, how that evolutionary urge, you know, how that comes through us. At a time, you know, where there is increasing intensity Just being aware of that vibrancy and allowing ourselves to be informed by that vibrancy, which is life itself. Which is constantly changing and like a river. Moving and changing and never really standing still.
and you know, really resonating with that vibrancy by listening into it. That's you know, our individual responses according to our gifts and according to our talents with which we came into this life. We all can contribute something small. To help you know to uh, navigate this transition. This evolutionary threshold. Where we can no longer wait, you know, for some kind of a father figure to save us, where we have to all be part of the response. You know, small ways. And that is a very amazing network of resiliency, a network of uh, sanity. Which is, you know, becoming more and more tangible as the old ways are crumbling. Literally, you know, crumbling by having baby Jesus lying on a heap of rubble in Bethlehem. And where it's so clear, you know, that this conflict isn't just between two nations, it's so many other nations are implicated and having a part in all of this. The incredible complexity which the thinking mind can't find a way through but by going back into the body and sensing into that vibrancy of life we can find a response from there And for that, we need to stop running and operating on that same level of consciousness which created the crisis in the first place. Mm -hmm. By dropping into a new narrative which is more expansive and alive and into which we have a direct line through our bodies, which are instruments for listening.
and then you know slowly we can uh, come back to the weight of the body on the cushion on the chair the gravity which shows us you know where we belong for now And in a moment or so, I'm going to ring the bell. And then if you can uh, just try to stay connected with the body from inside as you slowly maybe open your eyes and, you know, taking in who is sitting with you in the Zoom room today. Taking in, you know, that you're not on your own with this. That, you know, we have this little pocket of sanity in the midst of the web of many other pockets of sanity. Holding space and being ready to respond and responding where we can.